I want us to become brothers again like we used to be, and for us to find ourselves and bond with each other. Can we agree to that? Opinions vary. Welcome to Three Brothers Filmcast. I'm Anders Bergstrom, and I'm here with my brothers. Anton. And Aaron. My last name is the same as my brother's. And this month, we're discussing Denny Villeneuve's Dune Part 2, the conclusion to his adaptation of the legendary science fiction novel by Frank Herbert. And here we go. It's pretty fair to say that Dune Part 2 is one of the year's most anticipated releases, for the movie going public at large, and the brothers specifically. Aaron has seen the first one over a dozen times, and all three of us enjoyed the first film quite a bit. But... It's difficult to evaluate the overall success of the first film in financial or cultural terms, given its rollout in 2021 as a simultaneous streaming and theatrical release, part of Warner Brothers' late pandemic strategy with HBO Max, and also as only an adaptation of the first part of Herbert's book. But now, with part two in theaters pretty much everywhere, we can stand back and see the films that we've gotten and have a much more detailed discussion. Dune Part Two picks up pretty much where the first film left off. Paul Atreides, Timothy Chalamet, and his mother, Lady Jessica, played by Rebecca Ferguson, escape treacherous annihilation at the hands of the vicious and deranged House Harkonnen, and head off into the desert, having been brought under the protection of the indigenous Fremen of Arrakis. The first part of the film, part two, chronicles Paul's tutelage in the ways of the desert, and establishes a bit more of the galactic politics, introducing the Emperor and other houses, as well as the new champion of House Harkonnen, Fade Rautha played by Austin Butler. Jessica then embraces her role as Reverend Mother of the Fremen, and Paul begins to experience more and more visions of his destiny. The film climaxes with Paul in the role of Lisan al Ghaib, or the long-foretold off-world messiah, who will liberate the Fremen and transform Arrakis, resulting in a massive showdown between the Fremen, the Emperor Sardaukar warriors, and the Harkonnens. Dune Part Two builds on the careful world-building laid out in Part One. Villeneuve should be praised for taking the novel's notoriously intricate mythology and making it cinematically legible for audiences. The art direction and design of these films is fantastic. Dune Part Two is a cinematic spectacle in the best sense of the word. At the same time, in making Dune more legible to audiences, this comes at the expense of downplaying or refocusing elements of the novel. Some audience members who are unfamiliar with the novel may not get the significance of certain elements, particularly the roles of the other family houses of the Lansrad, or the Spice Guild, which controls space travel in the Dune story world. Some might accuse Villeneuve as simply excising some of the more challenging content from the novel in his adaptation. Still, I think that enough is there on screen to say that this film is a massive success at bringing the difficult novel to cinema. At the same time, it doesn't back away from the novel's difficult ending, posing a challenge to audiences reared on simplistic hero narratives. Dune Part 2 emotionally engages us with a hero whose own visions suggest that to follow his path to the ending audiences are primed for will result in war, genocide, and heartbreak. Okay, ramblers, let's get rambling. It's breathtaking. When you see sand here, imagine water. If you dive in, you can't reach the bottom. You dive in? Yes, it's called swimming. <laughs> I, don't, I don't believe you. In the shadows of Arrakis lie many secrets, but the darkest of them all may remain. The end of House Atreides. Your father didn't believe in revenge. What if Paul Atreides were still alive? I don't want to belabor my introduction because I'm sure we all have a lot to say about this film, our experience of watching it, and the larger Dune mythos. So I'll start with our resident Dune expert, Aaron. <laughs> For a fan steeped deeply in Herbert's mythology, someone who's read all the novels, and a massive fan of Villeneuve's Part 1, was Dune Part 2 a satisfying film experience for you? Yeah, it's, it's enormously satisfying, but it's enormously satisfying because it's a movie that understands the novel enough to make you somewhat hesitant and weary once you get the satisfaction of the triumph at the end you know we're going right into spoilers here yeah. it's based off a book from 66 like we're not <laughs> if, if you want to know what before, happens so. yeah if you want to know what happens it's been there on wikipedia your whole life like just chill um the 
A true adaptation that actually understands the novel's successes, what so many people who are know a bit of the novel and they might have read the first one, but they're not like dune heads, get wrong when they talk about, say, the, the 2000 sci-fi one is a true adaptation or the Lynch one is capturing the dream stuff. It's like Lynch doesn't understand Dune. Lynch and and the the failure of Lynch's version is actually the fact that the ending is played as a straight triumph with no complexity to it. It's simply like Paul wins. Yeah. He gets revenge. He marries the princess. And wait, he's still got his love on the side. So it's all good. Everybody's happy. And it's an ending. And the ending of Herbert's book is somewhat... Um, made more complex in light of the sequels that come after it. And so Villeneuve is creating this ending with knowledge of what comes after, even if, you know, he intends to make Dune Messiah, but even if he doesn't, he's crafting this movie knowing that that's where it ends up. Therefore, he's approaching this ending not so much as a triumphant hero, you know, Luke Skywalker blowing up the Death Star and he finally wins. He's he's crafting it a little bit more as like Hal becoming Henry V and having to you know, reject Falstaff to take the throne. Like it, it's this idea that there's a tragic element to it and there's a potential danger that comes further. So it leaves that's you a, with this foreboding. That's a great analogy, the, the Shakespearean one, especially Shakespeare's history plays, because I think one of the challenges that Dune faces in being adapted from the novel is it is a novel that is very interested in the sort of machinations of political intrigue, I have uh, questions around uh, sort of knowledge and foreknowledge and spirituality and, and all those things and how the question of what you know, how, how that impact, impacts your decision making. Um, it's not an original thought to me, but it's all, I think it, was, it makes it interesting for Villeneuve to uh, adapt the film, given his, one of his previous sci-fi adaptations, uh, Arrival, one of my favorite films of the last mm-hmm. decade, yeah. is also interested in the question of foreknowledge and how that shapes our, our actions and behavior. So uh, combine that with the world building that he demonstrated in Blade Runner, you know, I think that just shows that he, in a lot of ways, of all our big blockbuster directors who could actually handle the the budget needed as well as the scale and the complexity of the storytelling needed, he's, he was probably one of the best choices you could have mm-hmm. for that. So. Anton, what did you think of the film? Uh, had you when was the last? I, I rewatched Dune Part One the weekend before seeing it because um, I, I had seen it twice before, once in theater, and then I guess I watched it twice on Blu-ray. Um, when was the last time you watched it, and how did Dune Part Two play for you? I thought Dune Part Two was a tremendous cinematic experience. I thought it was great, um, but in the afterglow, once that sort of faded a bit, I do have some questions about. Uh, the adaptation, but we can get into that in a little bit. I saw Dune Part 1 twice in theaters. I read the book in high school. I haven't read any of the sequels. And then I was rereading the book when I saw Part 1. So when I watched Part 1, the book was very much in my mind. And it was kind of a process of evaluation of the adaptation while I was watching it in the first go. This time, um, Dune's still relatively fresh in my mind, the novel. But what I will say to Villeneuve's credit is that even if I might have qualms about aspects of the adaptation, in the process of watching the movie, I was so swept up by its effect that I actually wasn't concerned about them while watching the movie. And if anything, I was riveted and I was like thrilled that it was like arriving at the grand climax that it had been building up. And that it was going to do sort of the make the tremendous statements and caught and have the tragedy that Aaron's mentioned um, and sort of do all that large scale stuff. Um, so I, I really thought it was a great experience. I think in terms of a movie, it's just such an excellent combination of visuals and, and all the audio elements music sound it's very loud it's so loud and watching it on imax there's almost a constant reverb like beneath like i could feel the sound moving through my body the entire movie and it actually just kept me like disturbed and on edge which really sort of built up the the sort of anticipated fervor slash dread of him becoming sort of the emperor yeah because i think something that you point out though i and i think this is why i 
regardless if we get into the you know different interpretations of, of the adaptation element, the reason I have to stand by this as a good movie is because it's a good movie first and foremost. It's a it's not it's just a good movie. Like, I actually think like it's very good. It's very good. Great. It's like it's a it's a it's a great experience in the theater. And in I, terms of yeah, I just, just know on the level who, of like you know sort of more casual film goers than me have it being like, well, this is amazing. Being blown away. A lot of my students were really into it. So yeah, I think in terms it, of like special effects and uh, acting and, and it's one of those films that manages to combine, uh, you know, I think the quieter moments with, uh, you know, that the cast has to deliver the emotional beats yeah. just as well as the spectacle. Otherwise it would, I think potentially feel a little bit as a cold stylistic exercise, even if it does that really well, but the film isn't that I think it's, it, it stirs you up and emotionally grips you, but it's also like, honestly, like the only, you know, in recent years, the only, the only directors I think who are, are doing visual science fiction storytelling on this level are like Nolan and Cameron, yeah. right? Yeah. I, I think that um, this is the kind of movie where, yes, like I, I could point out aspects that I would interpret, you know, Dune differently, just just as much as like when I watched Lord of the Rings and I still good love the Lord of the Rings trilogy. But, you know, I have my different take on Lord of the Rings than Peter Jackson's, even though I immensely adore Jackson's mm-hmm. trilogy. But and I think you point out something that's interesting is that what I think Villeneuve has done here is also make this into an accessible work that I, I think w- will reach a wide audience and affect mm-hmm. a wide audience in a way that Dune has a potential because it is so dense, because it, it's philosophically inclined, it's interested in ecology, it's interested in deep expanses of history and in politics, that it could easily be a cold and distant movie for most people. But I think one of this film's achievements is that it actually draws us in emotionally, even though people will point out they're like, oh, you know, like it still has a bit of a coldness, but you can't get rid of that's mm, like the yeah. that's the tone of Dune. that's the tone of the film, but an end of novel, I would argue, too. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I want to get more of Aaron's reaction here, but the the other thing I would point out is that uh, maybe one of the reasons, and maybe we can talk about this a little bit later after we, we talk about the film itself and some of the adaptation choices, is that I do think this might be a film for this moment. In the same way that Dune was really popular with the late later sort of counterculture, late 60s, early 70s crowd. It's when our father first read it and other things like for a variety of reasons in the world at that time, concerns mm-hmm. about war, ecological crisis, the the crisis of political legitimacy and things like that. I think that Dune speaks to all those things now as we sort of are in a, in some ways, not to get too political, but like a, a kind of similar time to like the seventies was, uh, you know, in that area. Yeah. We're all anticipating emerging crises politically exactly. on a multitude of levels. Exactly. Yeah. As the, uh, what the tagline in the trailer for civil war that played for four yeah. dunes is all empires collapse <laughs> yeah. or all empires come to an end or whatever. And you know, it's, we're in that moment where everybody admits America is one of those. And so it's kind of put through that lens and as like a prism and that reflects everything out, um, refracts everything out. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I also think though, that there's an interesting aspect about Dune showing up at this moment in time where IP is not disappearing from Hollywood, but, the more modern IP has stopped having the purchase it does. And so you're required to look back a little bit further, whether it's a, you know, history, history, or even like something like Barbie, right. Which exists in the culture, but it wasn't like a movie property that's like front mm-hmm. of mind for people. And so it's familiar, but it's not like exactly the same in the sense of how it's approached. And that so we're at this moment where superhero movies have really kind of took in a dip, right? Like most of them bombed last year. Yeah. The only one that didn't was Guardians of the Galaxy. And part of that was, I think, people going and through a Spider-verse. Mass- yeah, and Spider-Verse. But those are both very different from the tip of, for various reasons. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Out, but go ahead, yeah. But, the, but they're going, you know, we went through this period where at least a decade of people being very happy with the typical hero narratives and wanting to feel, like, empowered by it and not actually chafing at it. But I think they got, like, kind of, sick of the childishness of it in a sense in like if we're if you're constantly going to be feeding this these hero narratives that are uncomplicated and the most that comes into it is some like emotional angst 
right? Or trauma over yep. like the violence that happens within the hero narrative, but it never actually complicates the concept of a mm-hmm. hero. This movie is this interesting anecdote where like, okay, people are kind of sick of superhero narratives. Well, here's this story about a character with superpowers who is a kind of, you know, ur text figure within science fiction, heroism and protagonists who embodies all the complications and contradictions that exist kind of outside the frame in a typical sci-fi narrative, but it actually brings it in where like, and it's not just a subtext thing, right? He, the sh- Dune makes text. The stuff text. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But so what, what, sorry, what aspect are you? Well, like the idea that with power, it's not just an idea that we need the right guy with the power. It's that certain power is going to like corrupt your soul. Yeah. And there is violence will lead to violence. Revenge is not a clear cut thing. It will actually like ripple out and always cause more like in every mm-hmm. conventional sense, Paul wins in this movie. Right. But and even if we, even if we agree, foreboding. That, yeah. So it is like so even, Tolkien in yeah. that the, the it's, it's understanding the of power has a, a, a tangible, even if we understand right. the revenge against the Harkonnens who are atrocious monsters. Yes. <laughs> I think that Dune complicates that perhaps even in some ways, uh, okay, I don't want to say more than Lord of the Rings, but differently because. Oh, I think it I does think because most, it's it actually complicates the hero more than Lord think, of the Rings. Yeah, but not so power. I guess what I'm, what I'm saying is, is that the the whole thing in Dune is that, and and I've 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 read sort of like the wiki delved into the Wikipedia of the larger thing, even though I haven't read the book. So Aaron, you can correct me if my understanding of how this this works out is a bit wrong. But the basic idea, and it's something that I think maybe the film could have played up Paul's visions a little bit more in terms of making it clear that how spice in altering your perception of time and space, they're not really just like visions per se, but like he's actually like seeing potential paths of the future, right? Yeah, he mentions drinking the water of life allows him to see the ancestral memory. He can also now see for these paths, right? And that he is faced with essentially an impossible choice, which is either destruction or you kill a lot of people in order to to save it. Right. The the path like the both Atreides and humanity of ultimately. Um and it's like, how do you make that possible? How can you possibly make that choice? It's an impossible choice to make. So you, you know, you can be, you can exactly be caught up in that idea of like revenge and action and the Harkonnens and yeah, <laughs> question, pronunciation of Harkonnen. I've always yeah. pronounced it Harkonnen. The film is Harkonnen. It is Harkonnen in yeah. the the text itself, but it's yeah. all these people are speaking with American accents and stuff. So yeah. like Harkonnen. <laughs> um, but the idea that like even a, you know, justified violence is, is a impossible choice to make because it's going to uh, potentially and we're not even potentially it's going to have side effects there's going to be collateral damage and the collateral damage might be in it on a galactic scale in the millions right so that's a really difficult choice because i think even in reality people often want to think that to take a moral stance leaves you unstained and i think that something tolkien understood about war is that war may be necessary but war is always going to leave you scarred. And the, the winning the war is not for the ones who fight it, it's for the ones who come potentially after. Muad'Dib, the prophet, the one who points the way. These are our own religious patterns, aren't they? This is our doing. Muad'Dib means kangaroo mouse, an unusual war name for a Fremen. What if Paul Atreides were still alive? Enough. This must not come out. Even to your father's ears, understand? I do, Reverend Mother. So here, here's, an in, uh, here's a thought I'm going to put forward to you guys. So Aaron mentioned Dune in relation to the superhero properties which dominated the past decade. Now let's go back to around the beginning of that boom, so Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy. So what I would say is if we compare... Uh, the hero in Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy to Paul Atreides in Villeneuve's Dune. What I find great about both these these portrayals is that they're both more open to the potential dangers to the dark side of heroism, of, of using violence to achieve what you consider to be sort of righteous or good ends. But in in embracing that there is this danger there is this dark side they have such a more vital and alive sense of what a hero is 
versus kind of the muted hero of the Marvel universe where like, you know, I'm, I'm never wowed and kind of like caught up with the, the intense charisma of, of the Marvel hero in a way that like, you know, Batman is appealing and part of the appeal is that there is the dark side. Yeah. Paul, like, little- what I would say in this movie, just to finish the thought is that I actually think that this is a movie that portrays Holy War in its um, ambivalence. Mm-hmm. That it True actually ambivalence. says that, you know, when we look at Stilgar, Javier Bardem, and the way he embraces it, it's like you can see why someone gets caught up in this and that this is the way to paradise. And it's it's a, like a thrilling thing for people. And mm-hmm. at the same time, the Holy War is going to like lay waste to so many lives. The Jihad, as it's called in the book. But yeah, film yeah. can't go there because of contemporary politics. Yeah. But the I think that you're you're pointing out a really important thing, which is that a lot of times you can, so you can you can have a film that has an uncomplicated hero narrative, right? Yep. Um, or you can have a film that wants to quote subvert that often, and and but and and point out the dangers potentially in like you know people who like casually toss out the idea that Batman is a fascist you know fantasy or something yep. like that or you know as was very theory, common kind of after Nolan yeah. made exactly and I'm like okay okay but like. Usually that critique is all too easy. All too easy. Because it wants you to think that it's uncomplicatedly, uh, you know, well, anyone with any moral sense would just, you know, if you weren't a bad person, you wouldn't be attracted to that thing. To really understand the danger of fascism, messianism, uh, the, the idea of seeing, taking upon yourself the role of like hero and stuff like that. I think one has to acknowledge the appeal. If you don't acknowledge the appeal, all you're doing is saying that your stupid, your enemies are stupid. Your enemies are uh, uncomplicated. You can still say that it's morally wrong, but you, if you acknowledge that there's an appeal to it, it makes the moral choice more, more difficult in some ways. And it's actually more realistic. I always think of like people who are like get angry at Wolf of Wall Street for being like, this, this, how is this an anti-capitalist movie? This is celebrating Jordan Belfort's like excesses and thing. I'm like, exactly. And if you can't see that there might be an appeal for a young man in embracing that life of excess and selfishness, then how can you ever possibly turn them away from it? Because you don't understand the appeal at all. Yeah. And you can't offer any kind of alternative. Whereas Dune and Batman take that seriously to some degree. But Dune, even like Dune, in, why when people who criticize either the movie or the story itself and they kind of belittle its ideas and they, they they will sometimes point to like Herbert's stylistic limitations as somehow proof of it, the limits of his ideas, which is like absurd considering his ideas <laughs> are only matched by, in, in, you know, in science fiction is only matched by like Asimov in its terms of scale. And then outside of Asimov, it's like Tolkien and a few other fantasy writers. I'm not going to say George R. R. Martin. His world thinking, his way of thinking is smaller than Frank Herbert's because Frank Herbert's yeah. characters embody the contradictions in a way that's actually far more human than any of the characters in in uh, Game of Thrones. Though you know, they're like Oscar Isaac's Leto is very much a Ned character and things like that, where yeah. he's like too much of an innocent to actually survive the like the moment of conflict but um so there's obviously yes. elements there so that also that also points your comment that um leto in the first movie is like ned stark also reminds me that i think another thing that might make some people uncomfortable with dune is that it's a real politic vision like even though it, even though it's interested in sort of like the ideology of the messiah and things like this it also believes that like power like it's, it's, you know, I think your comparison to Hal and Henry, uh, the Henry uh, tetralogy, you know, of uh, Shakespeare is good, too, because there's there's this sense that it believes that to manage um, states on a certain scale, you will have to sort of enter uh, these machinations of power and, and do certain things. It, Somebody has to wield power. Yes. The question is, who thinks that they're strong enough to do it? Paul becomes Paul. Yeah, this but- is, I do have a question. Do you think the. My sense is that the film well, that's the whole question of the whole Dune series plays up Paul's skepticism of, of his role a little bit, which is a tendency that most film like modern adaptations things do, like not quite to the degree that like 
Jackson does with like Aragorn in Lord of the Rings, but there's still a, a little bit of that sense. But I think that mm-hmm. is a little bit in the text, like, okay, this power is great. Do you think you're the one who's strong enough to wield it? Because somebody's going to wield it. If you don't wield it, the Harkonnens are going to wield it or someone else will do it. So do you take that burden on yourself? Which which may be self-serving in some ways, but at the same time is like, as you say, a real politic. It's like, well, what it is, well, is that what would you rather have? That that stuff's in the text. It's just it's it's internal and he externalizes because you can't film is not as good as books at getting the internal lives of characters. Um, I also think that the the performance of Chalamet kind of requires it because because he's not the kind of person like the, the, in this role, he I, I actually think he's well cast and he works well in it, partly because he begins unassuming and we don't expect him to have the physical prowess and, you know, the abilities in that sense. But I buy him by the end. Yes. But I but I also think that like him sort of externalizing the the desire to not go there is is almost required because yeah, it's probably it, necessary it, in adapting yeah. for cinema. Yeah, but I, I mean, uh, like, I kind of want to just go back though to a point. Where, like, it's important, and I think, as I said off the top, the true answer of whether it's a successful Dune adaptation is whether it has this feeling of foreboding, tragedy, complication within the the climax. But like, let's not overstate. And you said it, Andrews. You you did say, but it's like how let's not. Um, understate I should say how much how thrilling it is for Paul to win Mm -hmm. like the there's the whole man that scene like when they like launch the 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 atomics and then then ride and then they come in with all the sandworms yeah just like it's an incredibly massive scale battle but even the moment that precedes them going south and he's like we'll go south and there's like a beat and he's like and I'll do what I have to I would do what I must and Shani looks at him and is just like this is, is this the end of like the Paul I know? And in a sense it is because he, you know, he gains all these memories, but he also is now burdened with power. He's actually realized that he can't, he can't push it down the road any further. A choice has to be made now. Yep. And, and the choice is like, yeah, do you try and bend the path to your will or do you succumb to somebody else doing it? And that's, that is just the nature of these, you know, a game of Thrones. If you're in that game, you're going to have to play to win or you lose. Like yep. <laughs> that's a, game of Thrones is good. in some of those things of like the witty turns of phrase and dialogue and stuff. And, but then you get the development of the character, right? And people, some people have described it as like a flattening of the character, but they're misunderstanding all the different elements that are in the performance and in the film and how the final moment when he takes the throne ripples back and so you recontextualize what he's doing. So it's like, does Paul actually believe he's the Kwisatz Shadrach? It's like, well, he is. Doesn't matter. It doesn't. No, he but is. like he is. But does he actually think he's the Fremen's prophet? Well, probably not. But he's gonna. He has to use it. Whether, but he's not necessarily using it as like a wantonly wielding yeah. it. Right. He's using it because it's the only way that he gets to the next step. And but even so, within their prophetic framework, it's required that he doesn't want it. Yeah. Right. But like the whole scene. I love actually have your oh. bird dance performance of Stilgar is so good in this movie. It it's is like he of course is the Yeah, it's actually adding some moments of levity, but there's a complexity yeah. there and like a full yes, humanness absolutely. to him. I really like his character. He's Stilgar's a great character in the books too, and he's a very important figure, not only as like, you know, the indigenous character, because something that's not in the movie, but it's in the books, is like Chani's only half Fremen, right? Because in the books, she's Lee Keynes's kid. Mm. And mm, Keynes yeah, yeah. is also, yeah. Because Keynes is male in the exactly, but um, they don't have that movie, which I think is a smart choice actually. Because the I it would be too simple to have like the black lady from the first movie has the black daughter from the second. Like you know what I mean? It'd just be one of those reductive yeah, yeah. storytelling things, and it's unnecessary. It it works. She's Fremen. That's all you need to know there. And yes, I actually, and in this telling, Keynes is is a lesser, less exactly. significant character. Keynes doesn't because we're not really because the ecology the and appendix stuff. and stuff. Like There's that. no planetology stuff, so you don't need it. Right. Yes. Um, but what I was saying is that like the like stepping a few things back is that basically as as we see Paul's transformation play out, it is thrilling to see him like take up the mantle. And I'm impressed by Chalamet's performance because he's so physically unassuming, but he and he's a very like soft interior actor, you know, 
very emotional, but in a kind of sulky way. So to have the moment when he like rallies them in the middle of that like enclave, yep. he it's a he could have completely botched that in so many different ways. It's such a delicate balance of a character performance. Yeah. And he actually is like, by the end of it, you're like, he's badass. Like it's, it's kind of ridiculous to be like, Sha- Timothy Chalamet is like super <laughs> cool. And I believe he could like kill anybody in that room at that moment. <laughs> and it would yeah. maybe. And then the way the movie pays off the like, so one of the reasons why I think he doesn't show more of the visions is that he doesn't want to give away the climax, right? Yep. It's the classic movie thing. We talked about this on other episodes. If you show that when it actually plays out in real life, it has to be somewhat different. This movie is doing a lot of interesting variations where it's repeating things from the first movie, but showing the, how it's changed because of the choices he's made, mm-hmm. such as Shani is the one doing the fight when she's fighting the Sauter car. It's mirroring his vision of the golden army in the first one, but it is him in the first one, but it's her in this. Yep. She has some lines that Jamis says in the first movie where it's like, yep. I'll show you the way there's moments on the dunes. And he's always kind of going back to Jamis as this, you know, kind of almost gin haunting him that it's like, who's <laughs> you're going to lead me. You're like my original vision. So it can all come back to that, but it's, that's where you get the vision stuff, but he doesn't do it because I think he, he knows how important it is for the climax to work. It can't, it's not just a matter of the themes have to hit about the complication of his winning. It's also that it has to be like overwhelmingly intense and cool and like massive scale. (laughs) He has to actually pay it off as like a super cool battle that matches Lord of the Rings style battles. It's not just, Mm -hmm. you know, in uh, Avengers Infinite War where it's Mm -hmm. like Infinity War where it's like, oh, we're having the big battle and it's just a bunch of CGI guys smushing and it's so boring. There's no tactics. Uh, yeah, and you, they they smush, and then and then you do it where everyone gets to sort of take their turn to go up to the baddie and like do a punch. Yeah, but this one there's like a tactics. There's tactics. There's multiple layers of the battle. It's a little bit of multiple Return of the Jedi, there. where it's like the fight inside the pyramid, the Emperor's pyramid, which I think is super cool, the design wise. <laughs> I do think there's more than I, a touch of Star Wars. I think the this, because obviously Throne George Room Lucas is super influenced <laughs> by do. Yeah, how do we? The it's Return of the Jedi. But I was trying to explain. So I I went. By the way, I went to see the film in IMAX with my my kids, my boys, who are 10 and 12. It might be a bit overwhelming for them, but they liked the first film enough that they really wanted to see it. And, and Rochelle, my wife, wanted to see it too. But uh, <laughs> like I was trying to explain to my, my younger son, like because it's quite morally complicated for a kid, even if mm-hmm. I don't think it's like, uh, you know, there's nothing like that I wouldn't show, haven't shown him in other films necessarily. The... Uh, but like trying to explain to him, like, because he didn't, he really couldn't quite grapple with why Paul did what he did. Right. And I'm like, well, just think about like, in a sense, it's like we're watching the movie. It's like, if it was compared to Star Wars, I'm like, we're watching Anakin. <laughs> but it, instead of like becoming corrupted, like, and what if Anakin actually did kill the Emperor and set himself up in a position of power because he knew he was the chosen one or something like that? Like, I'm trying to like just shade it. Like, mm-hmm. we're, we're kind of drawn into the hero's journey yeah. with him. Or what yeah, if Luke and, took and the lightsaber and killed the Emperor yeah. in Return yeah. of the what, Jedi? <laughs> to, to go back to Aaron's, you used the word transformation for Paul. And I think the film actually puts forward like a transfiguration. It's like an exalting of something that's actually within Paul. Because he is a sort of a spiritual figure in this. But it's also the I, your, your phrase, right, taking up the mantle. Because if we go to like Aragorn and stuff, there's also a sense that it's like this is actually what he like has to do. Yeah, it he's not he's he's not like Paul is not his true self until he actually achieves that. Yeah, I partly think because they, his mother's been training. Well, he's been bred for it. Genesis have been laying the seeds for this for. for yes, and genetically now, right? they've been you know going. This for is this why for the what, this is why I think the film focuses out of all the sort of like other powers that the film doesn't. We can touch on like you know uh, some of the other the powers in this galaxy it doesn't touch on it. It definitely makes clear the role that, of the Bene Gesserit because they're the ones who make Paul's, you know, it takes whole time role on the, the interlude yeah. on, um, Getty oh, prime um, or what? Getty yeah, prime. Yeah. What's right. What just say the name again? The heart, Getty prime, Getty prime, the uh, Harkonnen, the Harkonnen like, home uh, world. Yeah. That long, dark, super creepy sequence does take its time to show, um, how the Bene Gesserit are playing both sides yeah. And trying to, you know, we have multiple options. There are We're no, no sides. Yeah. There, there are no sides. There, there is no playing sides. the yeah. human side. The... Well, it's it's also a great idea in their mind. In their mind, yeah. The way um, the way Villeneuve structures this to save 
uh, Fade Rautha until the second part. Then we get a classic Shakespearean, like Fade Rautha is the foil to Paul. He's, so he's hot. Yep. So we get this perfect like um, parallel track they're both set in. And by taking that time on Getty Prime, it actually sets him up as we could like see that this could be a possibility that they would create. Because as, as as vile as his character is in so many ways, we can also see why he he's not um, he's not just like the well the Robin. Lord Harkonnen, right? He's there's more to him, even though he's well, like it's what ironically I, like, I would say that Robin is actually ultimately becomes a little bit almost in this film because I think Villeneuve's love of uh, <clears throat> Batista, Dave Dave, Batista. Uh, yeah, Dave Batista is that Robin actually has a little bit almost of a tragicness. To him. Like he's not actually strong enough. <laughs> like, you know, like they're like, well, you're actually the weaker nephew. Like you, yeah. you actually haven't pulled this off uh, because he's not a compl- as completely a psychopath yeah. <laughs> in the sense of like, I'm a d- unemotional. Like Robin always gets angry, right? He's always like, smashes the guy's face and things like that. Whereas Fader Rasta actually does despite his almost like sort of blank, psych, like true psychopathy, he's like, is a more like capable leader, you know, in that sense. Well, there's the the line that Lady Fenrig, Lady, Lady Sedu's like almost yeah. cameo-ish appearance in this movie ha- yeah. where she makes the comment where he's like, he's, in, he's intelligent. It's like sadistic, motivated primarily by, uh, by pl- like pain and then honor. <laughs> and that's the yeah. key thing is that he actually has like a weird internal code that is he adheres to. Which makes yeah. him useful, yes, in right. a way that Robin, who's only prey to Driven his emotions, by. isn't. Yeah. You humiliated our family. You humiliated me. Kiss or die. All, but, we, so there's yeah. there's if there's two things one Ooh. last thing about okay, the themes yeah. and the way that the adaptation i think you know i've mentioned already that i think that this is really the right moment for dune i think it's interesting going back to some earlier uh you know sort of sh- novels and stories and adapting them in you know with the new technologies that are available and, and things uh if there's two things that i think are that are maybe difficult for audiences to connect with that are foreign in some ways to our societies one trying to explain to people that as a feudal system and society they're all driven by honor you get that really well in the first film that like leto's need to like i have to do this just because it's required and like the whole why do i have you know paul being like why do i have to wear the suit why do i have to do this thing it's like because these are the rituals that our society is built on the idea of a society built on ritual and honor and these kind of things is a little bit foreign to our society Mm -hmm. and two i think the notion of fate Right, the idea of like a fate is like in the books and in the film, and I think that a lot of people have a hard time with that because, in in a weird way, even though we we a lot of people do tend to believe that like people are products of their, you know, society and things like that. I don't think people really do believe that. I think that you know that this though has a more, you know, classical view of things like almost like Greek tragedy, like Shakespeare, that that it touches on in that way. I don't know. What do you guys think? No, I, I agree. Like it's more primal in certain senses, but I also, sorry, like I'm, I'm, I'm drawn to a comment you briefly made though, about how like almost Dune is made possible because of the technologies that we have available to us now. But the key for a, like a correct adaptation or interpretation of these kind of works is allowing the like traditional elements to come forward without like changing them. So I'm, I admire um, the foundation TV show on apple tv plus like i think it's quite good but it is not a successful adaptation in the way that villeneuve's dune is because it's a it's an i don't want to get too soundtracked here but it's almost an impossible choice in adapting something like foundation which is central to its actual thesis as a work is that individuals are not important therefore who's your hero psycho history is that what's called psycho history which again like People talk about Dune, Dune, Dune. It's the it's the Ur text for sci-fi. It's like it's the big, overwhelming one. Foundations the Ur text. 
because but to Armstrong, I feel like Foundation and Dune also kind of interact and because I think Asimov and Herbert also have some different views on but things too. Foundation is late 40s, early 50s. Dune yep. is si- mid 60s. Counterculture. So yeah. Foundation literally really lays counter- the foundation of sci-fi storytelling and it's this idea of things can be predictive. You can do, but his thing is it's science that does it, right? Yeah. yeah. And in Herbert, it's religion and it's politics and it's, and class. drugs. <laughs> no, but on the, yeah, he's these other things. He's it's caught up in the Pacific, the Pacific Northwest, right? Yeah. Um, but what I'm saying is that, so the Foundation series, it's a good show. It's compelling. The characters are interesting. But the issue is that it fundamentally changes a bit of the, the core message of the book mm. by making, by figuring out a way to have certain characters all around for eons as opposed to just like their period, their chapter of the story. Yeah. Dune, I don't think that like Dune, these movies understand it. And even though it strips away elements in the adaptation, it's like the core of Herbert's book is also the core of the movies. Like it's the same mm-hmm. story they're telling. But I guess what I would say is it chooses what will be the core. Like, I don't think it's wrong in choosing the political and the hero journey as being the core that it wants to emphasize. But it like, it's, you couldn't do... You couldn't do the the philosophy of Dune sort of in a popular narrative film. No, you couldn't. That's that's what I was saying about the how the ending has to be exciting. Yeah, while mm-hmm. also being deflationary, it's the kind of thing like it's it, you can't make them. However much I love the Spacing Guild, however much I love the Benny Tliax, how much I love all the little weird shit that is going around in the margins of even the first book in Dune. Well, okay, you can't have a movie that would be a rousing epic hit with audiences that would have the level of interest in all the esoterica, even though that stuff's important Yes, in the novels, because like to get the message across on the one hand, you have to actually have it a like enthralling hero's journey that works on film. <laughs> well, here, so here's my question that I've been trying to think through with the first film. I felt that, you know, this was two and a half hours that the, that film could have had 10 more minutes and fleshed out some of the things that I think are just really interesting on the margins. And I almost feel the same way with this film. And there's a couple of things that I actually think could speak to our moment that are strangely not present. So the whole ecological side, the, the, the fact that the Fremen are trying to take what was turned into sort of this desert planet and are trying to make it, you know, not just a spiritual paradise, but actually like, bring paradise. back the water. water back. That's why we've been saving the water. We get a little bit of that, but I actually think that would resonate with audiences with concerns about climate and all those sorts of things. And that you wouldn't have to like make it the main focus, but actually just a few lines of dialogue. Yeah. The other thing I think now more this year than I thought in 2021, because of all the AI talk, the whole idea Butler of like men tats in a world where humanity has decided that they're going to reject yeah. um, any sort of robotic artificial intelligence and only use essentially old forms of how you want to get things. You, you will, you know, will will train, will discipline, will selectively breed to alter people, but we're not going to use computers. Mm-hmm. And so, like, just a li- like in this movie, the men tats are gone. Yeah, they're um, only Dufer, appear, how it never Peter returns. Only are in the first, yeah. Well, well you have the, no, you have mentats. The, 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 the movie course. never the movie never explicates that they're mentats. It's yeah. the P, it's the yeah. Harkonnen standing around the command center going yes. brr, 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 like they're doing yeah, the, weird, the guy like, tracking. Who, the guy who's navigating for them. And then, they're human robot. Yeah. yeah. And the spice guild is a little bit this more is difficult the, because the, once you get into that, my my main thing with this movie is commented in the first one. It yeah, is, but the one- and the first line of the movie, the line in this movie before the like even the like yeah, credits is like whoever, whoever controls the spice controls the universe but, is but, like, but why? But like, yeah. I think Here's the I question, understand why? it. It's hinted at, but they need to make it clear that like without spice, there is no space. Travel. Well, so here's they, my they only- mention it in like two lines in the first. My film, only thought is they need that- to reiterate it one more time just to make it clear because, like. Then it means that spice is not just this mind altering drug that's going to give Paul his powers. It is the the key to controlling the universe. And then it's like it's like oil. It's like yeah. whatever whatever resource that we we need. To- yeah. So this this is the other. Well, this is related to that. Then, um, so 
with not having the spice sort of front and center, um, it really, to me, it just raises the question, then why does everyone want the spice? Like it, it's sort of the thing where like, I feel like it could be slightly fleshed out more to make more sense, but I am left with a lingering thought that because I know that Villeneuve has already said he's, he's started the script for the next one. This one's called right. Dune part two. My mm. expectation We'll see. It might just the next one. It might just be Dune Part Three, rather than Dune Messiah. I think so. yeah. And you'll probably take parts of that. I don't know if you'll do the whole book, or I don't. I don't know. Maybe yeah, I know it's do a the shorter whole book. book. He's said it. Okay, it's, it's shortest, shorter but, than. But so is he going to save things like the reveal about what the guild is and what the yes, source of power is to. as a reveal for the third, and then what this movie becomes as all the sort of online chatter is. This movie's Empire Strikes Back. Yes. This movie is Matrix Reloaded. <laughs> no, strike that from the record. No, but you, no, but you like know, I mean, that Messiah, in the way that Revolution more completely re- undoes your yeah, yeah expectations of everything. I was saying this to friends afterwards, and they they some of them brought up the Spacing Guild. They don't know the not all only one of them had read the book, but the others hadn't, and they were like, "Oh, it's too bad we don't have the Spacing Guild there." And I was like, "Well, I just didn't think Villeneuve wanted to introduce a guild navigator." if it's not a character and you get a character in the next one, who's a guild navigator. So you have to inevitably introduce it because the whole concept in Dune Messiah, not to spoil stuff, this is set up things is that um, guild navigators are the only ones who are invisible to his prescience. So the idea is that if you're in the presence of a guild navigator, because they're folding space and time Mm -hmm. that Paul cannot predict what is going to happen in that room with that person. And so there's this whole the whole plot of the second book is this conspiracy to kill Paul, basically. So, well, yeah. yeah. Well, and so, so it's about like, the guild. <laughs> but I thought it was interesting. So as to compare to the David Lynch film, where the where the guild, the bizarre like yeah. mutant yeah. sort of guild thing, but Fish that person. becomes that's actually what you know. You mentioned how Lynch is not interested in a complicated um, Paul arc. And at the end, us being sort of being like, is he going to actually become this terrible figure in the Holy War and all this sort of stuff? Whereas that movie is kind of interested in revealing, you know, that the, the the weirdness that kind of drives this universe. Yeah, no, it's true. But it's that it's the idea is like, what is the essence of Dune? The Dune world, everything in it is fascinating it's why we love it it's the strangeness it's the defamiliarization of familiar elements from our past and from our conceptions of the future right it's a it's as about as strange as a future you can ever get there's nothing alien in this world but the human humans humans alienated alienated yeah made strange yeah but the thing that Villeneuve gets is that ultimately all the religious questions all the political stuff all the ecological stuff it's ultimately posing moral question a a central moral question about like power about humanity's relationship to each other and to the earth and like what is an actual moral path because the whole thing and within the whole when you take the whole dune cycle the central plot is the golden path and it's the idea of like you can you hew to the golden path which creates a future for humanity that is free of all these horrible things Mm-hmm. And it's only possible by somebody who transcends humanity, essentially. That's the idea. And you get this most in the later sequels with like God and yeah, yeah. Dune, Lee, his son, right? Yeah. So strange. It gets, you know, when they talk about the first Dune is unfilmable. No, the first Dune is difficult to film. God and Dune's probably unfilmable. Like <laughs> it's, I don't know how you. That were Lee, yeah. It's where, <laughs> Never, yeah, there's a, there's a 4,000 year old worm person. Like that is the plot. Yeah. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that like the Lynch thing, Again, Lynch is not interested in Dune as a ultimately a means of posing a moral question for its characters and thus its audience and the world. He thinks of it as a political dimension. He thinks of it as a carnival, right? Mm -hmm. And Villeneuve might, but and then the other is that like, do people not understand that these movies are really really weird for a normal moviegoer? (laughs) They're already very weird. (laughs) Yeah, already like some people would be like. Baron Harkonnen and, and like, Oak. yes, I'm done. Like, I'm out. That's what I mean. Like, they're too weird. That's yeah. what I mean. It's like people need to take a step back and then get outside of their film Twitter sphere. Stop. Get out of their ivory tower bullshit. Stop being hoity-toity about stuff and be like, well, actually, I would have loved it if they had the fish people who bathe in spice. Like, dude, the normal guy <laughs> who goes to see a Marvel movie 
thinks the whole sequence on Getty Prime is like the weirdest thing he's ever seen. Thinks it's super cool, but will be like, why are there guys in alien xenomorph suits walking around a thing in like a monochromatic black sun <laughs> that makes everything black and white? Well, the yeah, like a witch, sun. a oh, witch like, like seduces so him and steals his semen. Like, what is going? Like, how is this yeah. not weird? <laughs> okay, and so this ties into um, this relates to what you said, and then to push in a different direction. But so Villeneuve, like Nolan, um, okay. Nolan's films, right? Like I teach on Nolan. So it's like Nolan is always trying to introduce um, innovations, originality, novelty into his films. But at the same time, he always has to temper them with familiar aspects. So if you take a movie like Inception, um, you know, has its dream layers. We're going to go inside. We're going to steal ideas, plant ideas, etc. But then it's also a heist movie, an action movie. There's cars, there's guns. Um a movie like this isn't doing a bizarre concept like that, but Villeneuve understands that this is a super strange world. And so he'll lean into, he selectively leans into certain aspects to make them very strange and, and portray them as very strange. And then through um, costumes, through sets, and also through some uses of words, he also makes certain things more accessible and understandable. So his because he wants to reach a wide mainstream audience with this film. Because if you make Dune just like, kind of like the, the letter of the text, your average film goer will be like, what on earth is going on? Because when I was rereading um, the first Dune novel, it takes the George Lucas principle of, you know, like when you're watching a foreign film, I, I had this idea that for a sci-fi movie, I kind of just throw people into like, you're watching like a Japanese film and you don't quite get what's going on. And like, you know, he, Lucas does that a bit in Star Wars. We're thrown into this world, but we still get the beats. And if we were going to do that in Dune, like the book throws you into a world. And you're, I was remember reading like a couple of years ago, right? Like the pages and you're like, wait a second, what is this? Like uh, now I have a whole new term. It's not explained. And then I just have to, context. that term will only make sense by the time I've read 50 more pages and people have used it a bunch of times. Which is but, how you learn about things in real life often. Yes. But so like, so Frank Herbert's Dune uh, just thrusts you into its world and you you learn as you would through experience, you know, like in the real world. In a two and a half hour, three hour movie, you can't do that. So he has to selectively use certain familiar things. What I picked up on, and this is to pivot slightly, would be, you know, I was like, oh, so he calls Fade Routha a sociopath. I was like, would they really have the word sociopath in the Dune universe? Probably not. But... He wants to make that very clear that this guy, you know, is unhinged and that he doesn't have moral qualms. The other term, and this is where I want to pose a question to you guys. I think it's very interesting that we can't use the word jihad, but we can use the word fundamentalist. Yeah. <laughs> and I, and so, you know, what I, my question is on this film that it's like, so is it that we're uncomfortable with aligning, even though the Fremen indigenous population in a desert location, you know, where a resource is trying to be extracted to travel the universe. Obviously, right, Herbert was thinking of, uh, you know, Arab peoples in desert lands and people going, you know, colonizing powers going for oil. But he doesn't want to, he leans into that somewhat with uh, some of the portrayals of the, you know, the, the Fremen culture, but he doesn't want to lean too heavily. And I feel like there's a sense in this film that when they get to the holy war stuff, they don't want to make it just a representation of like political Islam, Islamism mm -hmm. yeah, on think, film. I think that's the right choice because I actually was reading, listening to a couple of things like about Herbert's background. But the word and fundamentalism himself, makes sense yeah. for a wide audience that people are like, oh, yeah. that's what we're we're talking about so on a religious dimension. We, you know, because Herbert understood that jihad literally is just Arabic for holy war. Like yeah. it, it actually has multiple connotations, but because of current politics, it you know, we only associate it with fundamentalists in that way. Right. Um, but the other interesting thing is like, yes, he was obviously, there's no question. He uses Arabic words. He's influenced by Arabic culture and things like that. And the analogy with the desert and stuff like that. But he was also very deeply uh, embedded in indigenous communities in the Pacific Northwest. I had no idea that Frank Herbert, like spent two years of his teenage years living with a guy. We called him Indian Henry, but he was this father's friend who was like indigenous, I forget which uh, tribe from Pacific Northwest. And so uh, the dreams. Who, who like taught him and trained. Dream culture and, and basically, and all that. Yeah. So he's, he was actually very conscious of American 
like Manifest Destiny and the mm. plight of indigenous peoples in North America, actually, as much as he was there. And because he'd never been to the Middle East, but he was he actually wrote two other books about Pacific Northwest yeah, indigenous Soul peoples Catcher. as well. Oh, he's one of them. Yeah. yeah. So he's like he is very much embedded in that uh, that culture and is a key interest of his. So I think that's interesting as well. Your blood comes from dukes and great houses. We don't have that here. Here, we're equal. Men and women alike. What we do, we do for the benefit of all. Well, I'd very much like to be equal to you. Maybe you could be from it. Maybe I'll show you the way. I wanted to take one of your comments on it and sort of turn it in another direction. We talk about things that people then can like in a very weird, let's, let's say the Dune is very weird in a lot of ways. And even <sighs> with Vil- people accusing Villeneuve of, you know, softening some things, whatever. As Aaron's point, this is still really weird for regular people. Um, so what are the, one of the ways that he gets people and hooks us is through casting, through having a mm. large roster of familiar actors. Huge cast. Uh, who huge are appealing. Cast. A huge cast, right? Like, I mean, the very fact that you've got Chalamet and Zendaya <laughs> as like the t- sort of two main characters who are kind of, you know, from their other work, still like if you, you know, take popular the, young adult actors. If you take the big female younger characters, it's like you know Florence Pugh, like um, Al- Anya Taylor Le- Joy appears yes. for in Leia Sadu. Yeah, like it's, it's <laughs> they're all there. <laughs> and then you got now Austin Butler, who's like on a high, yep. you know, after Elvis and Masters. Of the and Air, he gets to do but, a dark turn after being yep. you know, Elvis. Yeah, perfect. And you got even and a lot of the other supporting characters i mean he brings in there's so i I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the casting some of the acting yeah yeah. some of the actors and the choices um i wanted to go back to chalamet for a second because i was trying to figure out there's something about his performance that in this film that i really liked in dune part two i caught glimpses of it rewatching part one but in this one it really comes forward is do you know who the actor whose performance reminds me the most of in a really weird way is Hmm. nicholas young nicholas cage there's something about the way he holds his mouth and he says some of his lines through his like teeth, the way that he, he has a slightly slender build, but he has these outbursts uh, at moments. Like, like I'm thinking cage and like uh, moonstruck, uh, you know, the early days uh, of cage. And I'm like, it's a, it's actually, you know, it works really well. <laughs> hmm. I, I, in my mind, that's just, it, it's a very like sort of weird thing, but it's just like, in terms of a leading man, I also feel like Chalamet, might be more like that than like some of these other more like traditionally masculine mm-hmm. actors. So, so I like, I actually, I think it works really well. Um, th- now I'll flip to the other side, an act, a casting that I wasn't a hundred percent on board with. And he told me, I don't know how much, like, I think it's a good, he does a good job in the role as much as he can, but I'm not sure how much I like Christopher Walken as the emperor. What do you guys think? Yes. I think he's the, he's the one who fits the least because, because yeah. he's not going to conform yeah. to any, He's just walking, right? <laughs> like, I, I was, I think the, what I would just say is like, as much as I love Christopher Walken, I think at this time in sort of pop culture landscape to have Walken play the emperor and to not let him be sort of like really weird or unhinged is like kind of disappointing for the audience. People don't really expect to see Walken in anything now, unless he, unless he's being, you know, like unless he's being Walken and like doing weird stuff. And it kind of made the whole Emperor. I kind of agree with some comments that the Emperor, like, we don't know. You're like, is he this guy that powerful? Like, we, I don't buy that this guy's managing the universe. Maybe what they're going for is showing that at this stage he is kind of like a puppet who you know, is easy to to off. That really, you know, if if Paul doesn't go, the Harkonnens are gonna are going to take it all. Yeah. And then Princess uh, Arulan, is that who I say? Irulan. Irulan. She is the one really running the show. Yeah. No, th- and that's, but that's a thing in, it's an interesting thing because. But I don't Walken like the is, casting really. No, walking it, he's, he's. Florence Pugh is good, but. Yeah. Walking like good. doesn't really do much in it, but the emperor doesn't, you almost just need a big actor in it. Like in the yeah. book, the emperor is, deliberately set up as 
He's not strong. All, his only strength is the Sadakar legions and the fact that the Lanzarad will not. He's kind of created a somewhat of a peace between them and the space and the spice guild, right? Like mm-hmm. it's it's this idea though that if at any moment the Lanzarad or like the it's a weird, isn't power <laughs> exercised through fear of the Sadakar. The, the, the Sardaukar, yeah, the- yeah, it's fear of the Sardaukar, and the thing, though, and what and what Leto and Paul understand is the Fremen can beat the Sardaukar. Yeah, but it's the whole reason why, the whole reason why he does gives to you know to answer Christian's question or whatever. Yeah. Like it's like the whole reason why he gives Dune to the Atreides and then he takes it away is like the Harkonnens and the Atreides are both more powerful than me at this given moment. I need them to wipe each other lower (laughs) and because it is an open secret that he's weak. And that's why the Bene Gesserit have all these contingencies. And it's, I agree. It's not a thing that's explicit in the movie in any way, shape or form, but I actually think the idea of the emperor as a, like, he's a kind of an empty vessel. All he is needs to be is a powerful figurehead who is toppled by these other powers is key. I he's yeah. Walken's not my ideal casting there or anything, but also like the Padasha emperor is not super important. <laughs> Irulan's important, right? And the Bene Gesserit connections are important and Fade Roth is important. And the we should other be cast- thinking of emperor in what Edo, Edo Japan, who's not really running the country. He's not the Shogun. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, he's not an active emperor. Yeah. He's a, so he's, He's more of a figurehead to keep the peace between all the other actual pieces of power. But then, mm-hmm. so like if the walk-in casting, maybe you could have gotten a different 80-year-old that we all love <laughs> to yeah. be that role, who is a little more like stately or something. Could They but could have gone the British the route or something, right? They could have put Ian McKellen in there <laughs> or something. Or, you know, like if you really wanted to do some kind of... I, I thought that if you were doing a younger emperor, you'd do like a Maz Mickelson or something because that's the kind of like intellectual like power that uh, conveys much stronger. Mm-hmm. Um, but whatever. <laughs> I'm not yeah. going to overthink so it. He's still, he's still fine. But the so other casting saying. in the movie is like... Like so, Austin Butler's Fade Roth is awesome <laughs> so, yeah, he's, he's wild <laughs> like he goes goofy <laughs> yeah and with the black I'm glad they have the gladiators teeth, the black teeth really... and the like his his smile without without seeing his teeth his smile looks so sort of creepy <laughs> yeah but this <laughs> he, he leans like into it in a, Dinesh. <laughs> yeah <laughs> he does a good job like leaning into it. Black, no, he gets creepy. the tone he really nails yeah. the tone and the movie does a good job it, I was skeptical of not having Fade Roth in the first one. Yes, I was too. And then, but the way they did it here, I'm happy because they build him up. They talk about him yeah. and yep. you have the build. And it's so like, you have to have an actor with the charisma. Probably for like an hour into the movie, you finally get to Gady Prime again. And you, it's his birthday celebration in this gladiator yep. Yep. fight. And it's really, really good scene. <laughs> That's a long, like, weird sequence. Yeah, it's good, though, because it, and it's in like, it's, I think it's a little bit earlier in the book when we go. It is. That. It is yeah. beginning of part two, right? Yes. the The thing that I was gonna that before we like, if we want to talk about design stuff or other or things, like I just yeah. wanted to point out that I think one of the elements that shows the strength of Villeneuve's Villeneuve and his whole team of designers and cinematographers mm-hmm. and artists, right? Part of the strength of this film is borne out in the fact that like he already has this incredible world, Arrakis, and he's like. Well, we're going to go to another world, which I've shown you a little bit in the first one, but I'm going to like this world's going to be as cool in its own way as Arrakis, where it's like the monochromatic sun that literally drains the color when the sun beams hit. Mm-hmm. The fact that like the fireworks display are like ink blots in the sky, yeah. that it's like this weird world that's everybody seems to be underground. And, it, you know, it, this is a universe where people are like not, you know, um, robots and are outlawed and computers are outlawed, but this is a world of almost like drones and like bugs. Like it, there's yeah. something mm-hmm. it's people Absolutely. turned into and like layers a upon layers of slaves. Like, you know, in the sense of yeah. the, the, right. It, 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 what's really useful also on sort of um, how it's representation of this universe. It Getty prime really shows that the value of a human life doesn't exist in this universe. No. And then but, contrast but that with the Fremen, so just like in their life, life, right? They're, that's why they're like Romans, right? Yes, like, exactly. No, the slave is nothing. That's why the gladiator scene is so important. Yeah, no, exactly. But then contrast with the Fremen who have, 
you know, a Bedouin or Native American sense of like, you know, Jamis dies and it's like, we have to carry his body. We can't, we're not leaving it. Like it's, it's a sacred object. We have to give him the proper yeah. burial. Mm-hmm. The physical even, value of the water also Even has killing like, the Harkonnens, we have to take the water. It's, it's poison water, water, but we have to take it as it's at least going to cool yeah. down stuff. It's just the idea of yeah. like reverence for life because it's so hard on Arrakis. Yeah. <laughs> Can I want to? Yeah. So I, I just want to say one other performance that I think yeah, I just want to call out has been really, really good is Rebecca Ferguson. Yes, as well, Lady Jessica, okay. who's one of the hardest roles, who has to also undergo a transformation, and I buy her the whole time, and she's she's really great. So yes, so on that, so okay, this one, this movie, won me over to uh, Zendaya's performance. Yeah, as Chani, and I was like, okay, like after this one, I was like, okay, it was good they made her as Chani. Um, but what I'll say, what I thought was that Villeneuve, so at least from the, I haven't seen, you know, all of Zendaya's stuff by any means. I haven't seen Euphoria, which is what the big show. Yeah, that's what all the Emmys for. Yeah. I feel like, you know, Florence Pugh, Zendaya in this film, their performances don't have tons of layers to them, but Villeneuve really sort of uses the, the the few faucets he's sort of interested well and the the camera is very good at sort of like you know the princess right like we we sense more just even though it's sort of kind of almost like a blank stare at certain things we can we can we can sense more so it's partly the interaction between the performance and the way the director is sort of utilizing the actor's potential but yes like after this film it's like rebecca ferguson is becoming like one of my favorite actresses and I just okay. wish she was in like more stuff. Also, it's interesting. I th- just if anyone has a chance to to check out, just to speak to Villeneuve, you know, everyone talks to him as like this like technical director, like a, a you know special effects and all these things. His skill with actors, I think, it does sound like he's very good at working with them. Uh, there was a little interview with uh, again Dave Bautista, where he was talking about how much he values Villeneuve's direction. Hmm. That that Denny Villeneuve is one of the few directors, and I almost choked up listening. He said, "Who who praises him and gives him the confidence?" He says, "Like Dave, you're doing such a good job." And like, and he's like, and he he's like, he gives me the courage to actually give a performance that I don't always get to give. And I've seen that even in his small role in Blade Runner, it was like a different kind of performance mm-hmm. from Dave Bautista. You know, and I'm like, that just speaks, you know, whatever you think of his performance in this film, it speaks to the connection that Villeneuve was able to get with some of his actors to to draw different elements out of them. So, yeah, I, I mean, like, I was, it was neat, neat to hear that. Go back to Prisoners and it's like that movie yeah. is amazing for the performances. Jake Gyllenhaal and like um, oh Hugh Jackson. Goodness. Yeah, and Hugh Jackman. They're like, those are great performances. I just to go back briefly to a, mo- a comment you made, Anton, about like Villeneuve uses zendaya's like lim- somewhat limited performance not like a bad performance but it just doesn't have the same let's say a levels. restrained a restrained, restrained performance. performance but it it uses her her most like distinctive and ad- arresting element in this movie is her gaze like it's yes. a very intense stare a frown yeah but it's like a compelling frown like it's yeah a- and it the movie literally leads to that look like the the culmination of this movie emotionally is in the throne room paul i'll take it's like you know i will take your daughter's hand and this can all go away and i'll take the throne and everybody once once the emperor finally kneels and everything the only three people left standing are paul chani and erlan and then he turns around and looks back and she's just giving the like this stare of absolute like dejection at him and then she leaves and the movie ends with her kind of clarifying that the interesting change to the arc, it makes Chani kind of your emotional center line for this film. Yes, I was going to say, in the end of the movie, you're actually, you've emotionally transferred a little bit to her in some I some I think that's that smart. She's the most sympathetic character in some ways. Well, I think it's also a smart, even though I'd say like, yeah, like I'm actually not as, maybe I'm just like more pro Paul than you guys. Um, but like, oh, what, no, I, no. what I just I, mean. I think he's great, but. <laughs> no, but what I mean is that like. I, I understand her. I th- Feelings. I also think it's a smart choice by Villeneuve because I think it it plays to recognizing aspects of the audience and where anticipating where people's um, expectations and also people's um, sympathies will lie to to make her like a, an emotional anchor for the audience. Yeah, and the thing I'll say that this movie has more of than the first. Like the first. Its emotions in the first film are more drawn from the sense of tr- of tragic loss. Like it's it's tied up in the loss of Leto and then Duncan Idaho. 
Like those two moments, yeah. their deaths are the movie's emotional moments. It's where you're like overwhelmed with this. The idea. Boys really like Duncan Idaho. Yeah, Duncan <laughs> Idaho is super cool, right? And his death is really heroic and true, and right? Like it's like that's what a great warrior is. Like he's gonna take down all these Sardaukar and, and go down fighting and save his his you know his duke. Um, but in this movie, it it's more of a conventional emotional arc, but it actually pays it off really well. And I'm, I'm very skeptical of people who say, well, oh, you know, the, the romance scenes between Paul and Shani, which are, there's not a ton of them, but like, there's no. a lot of character building relationship scenes, but not yeah. a lot of like romance scenes between them. Right. Yeah. There's, there's them really working a, alongside each other. There's them doing the attack on the, the, the harvesters and this, that, and the other. And the movie you get a sense of being like, oh, you know, like I'm I'm not more invested in this love story than I am in any of the other elements, right? As you're watching it. But the way that that final triangle shot is and the like the final shot of the movie of her going out and calling the worm and she's going to leave, it like actually hits you emotionally to the point of being like, oh, well, I was invested in this because now I felt it's a loss here of something was grown between them and now it's not there anymore or it's changed fundamentally. Right. I think, and it's, it, yeah. I just think it, like the way that that ending hits on various different levels of yeah. on like a personal character level and not just thematic is proof of actually some very nice storytelling in the relationship between those characters over the course of the film. Well, and they represent, you know, it's, it's also because they show them being, um, you know, so they're guerrilla fighters throughout the film together. So it's like Paul's um, sort of rejection of, you know, that. Being Fremen. Yeah, just being a Fremen. And and also on a communal sort of social level. Yeah. Do you notice the way the that Eagles. Gurney Halleck is like Loving so it. excited when it's like, oh, he's be he's becoming the Duke. He's he's yes. re he's retaken on his Atreides her heritage. And in that sense, it's not it's not that he um rejects being Fremen but he says he's like I'm not just Fremen and, I'm, and and it's also very important that I'm a trade and that's my dialectical power, synthesis you know yeah. within this system that's set up um mm -hmm. so it works really well with that on the emotional the emotional effect of this film like maybe let's just we can end off with just talking about like as an action movie as a sci-fi action movie it's like it's been a while since like I think that the final battle, you know, it's it's up there with the Return of the King, where I'm actually so thrilled by sort of when the heroes ride in. But then also like the very beginning of the movie that you know it's not in the book. The eclipse scene. <laughs> yeah, this eclipse, you know, fight scene, and then like the the Harkonnens, they're they're approaching, and you're really creeped out. And like it's rare that like when the heroes are hiding from people looking for them, you know. I because we uh, there was the trailer for Furiosa before, and I had said to my friend, I was like, "Oh man, like I'm looking forward to that." Partly because like Mad Max Fury Road is one of the few chase movies where I had such intense dread of the heroes being caught. Yeah, and like in that sequence, I was like, "Yeah, like I'm really just creeped out." And you're like, "You just don't want these weird guys in the black to find them." So his these action scenes are good action scenes, but they also like. The re I found them just like really engaging and I can't remember like the last time a big blockbuster movie like like I was oh, really into of Life of Water. But... Yeah. Well I I you know I yeah, probably like this movie better than Life of Water guy. Then wait, wait, sorry which one? I probably Life like this better than Avatar oh. Life of Water. Well yeah, I mean it's because at the end of the however beautiful the Avatar movies are and I I do love those movies um Dune is a richer text <laughs> than Avatar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's more complicated, more complex. Yeah. Well, uh, Avatar is this pure emotion, overwhelming, beautiful emotion. <laughs> um, but then no, the film, I, this film builds up like it turns the attack on the Emperor's, you know, landing ship and all that into kind of like an attack on the Death Star moment. We start to understand the plan, but then it's so satisfying when you see like the different ways it's approached. Yeah, but it also mm -hmm. does smart movie escalation and storytelling that were like the whole first fight attack on the Harkonnen harvester shows tactics, right? And it breaks yep. down all the individual tactics. It's like, you know, the little Muad'Dib, the little kangaroo mouse 
bounces up and yep. he's like breathing through the tube and then they come out of this desert and the Villeneuve likes to use long takes at moments to really tie you into a moment and create the geography mm-hmm. and create a sense of like the real right in within this fantastic moment. So the camera, you know, pushes in, it, it trucks in to the side and then put dollies in when uh, the person's running out and then it follows forward. So you get this sense of like up from the sand and forward. So it's mm-hmm. like a real person was under the I, sand. And then I, it goes, to, I love when they do that whenever they <laughs> jump out of the sand. It's so cool. Like, but then the whole, the also whole the way that is, the details of the technology and the way that like their breathers, like have to like filter, like, so that sand doesn't get like, it's like that little, yeah, like, it sucks like, a little, in like, to, to let little shush yeah. on the, yeah. Like, the intake. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm just saying so that, much. I like the little detail in this movie. Exactly. It's, it's detailed, but it's detailed detailed on a on a macro scale and a micro scale yeah. design wise but then also within like blocking like that seems very patient action scene because it's Chani and Paul thinking through the way to blow up the ornithopter get through the shield they have to wait for the last gun to shoot like the or the 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 mortar gun to shoot right mola they drop the shield whatever, and, and shoot. then it, yeah. but they have to hide in the shadow of the walker itself so like plus you can only use the shields on the ship and not on the ground because of yeah, yeah but what i'm saying is that it's the kind of thing where it it is. I said this on the podcast many times. People are probably like going to be laughing at me, but it's this idea of like movies teach you how to watch them. Like what happens early in a drink. film is very important for later because the movie is teaching you what to clue into and what not to, and how that's going to pay off. And so it's all this talk of tactics, of tactics at, at a political level, on a on a ta- con- combat level. And then it actually pays it off in the massive fight at the end where it's like, okay, Gurney leads them to the atomics and this, and how is this all going to come together? I think this is a really important point because I think it shows what good filmmaking does depending, doesn't matter uh, what kind of genre of, of film or anything, that idea that film is a language of some kind that, t- that can speak to us through cinematic concepts, camera movement, editing, all these kind of things that it, um, can also um so film does that um and that you can use it either to confirm to teach for the future or and this is the problem with too many films that want to subvert things they don't establish a convention they rely they often rely on a shorthand or audiences preconceived notions that they bring with them rather than establishing those things within the text themselves if that makes any sense mm-hmm. right so like good good directors like I was just thinking because uh, I was teaching it today, Hitchcock in, in Psycho, uh, like the way that he confounds our uh, expectations about Marion uh, Crane, you know, and the murder, it, you know, about half hour in, uh, really not a lot happens. Like, but he has to establish Marion as a character. He, ha- he has to establish motivations. He has to establish her sense of uh, anxiety over the some stolen money mm-hmm. and things like that, or else the murder doesn't have the same weight. Yes. You can't just be like, oh, I'm, you, you're expected the main character to live. I'm just going to kill them off. Like, no, he does the work of teaching us to to think about it a certain way before he pulls it away. And you can do that either in subversion or you can do it in confirmation. But too many movies just don't do that that work of using film language to te- to to help the viewer which is why i would say that villeneuve is one of our masters of scale in film and i don't just mean but i i do mean like the actual sort of the geography or setting in terms of like you know aaron you mentioned right this this is a movie that has such vast scale shots large scale shots and then but i also mean on the interplay between the larger historical or sociopolitical importance, and then the the personal. And Villeneuve is very good at understanding that it's like, I have to spend time on this personal moment because that will impact, you know, the, the larger, we won't understand the larger scale um, social interaction or, you know, political maneuver unless we understand that personal moment. And so it's like between scale within a human sense, but then also scale in terms of how you construct a shot, you know, I think back to Arrival and just like those vast ships coming in. But then I think the prisoner is just like in people's faces and they're like intense. Have you heard what his next movie might be if it's not Messiah? No. Rendezvous, Rendezvous of Rama, of Rama which is no. so fitting because it's Arrival, essentially. <sighs> it, it would be, I just, I'm, I in my mind, I have an image of them the first time going down the chasm when they get onto Rama. And it's like, you understand this, you're entering this alien creation and this world within and the like 
the scale and the the strangeness, man, I really actually do hope he takes. I always loved that great. novel when I was younger. I should. <laughs> I haven't read it. Like, but I mean, it's great. It's, great. it's, it's a great novel. Um, no, I, I absolutely agree in the sense, and that's that's the thing that ultimately why I think this movie registers with people who even think it's a weird universe that might be a little out there for them and stuff. Is that the movie is smart enough in construction and intention for the small, intimate moments and the massive moments to both hit and to work in conjunction so that it leaves you with the feeling that like the story actually deserves, right? It, it, it ends mm-hmm. where it's supposed to. It's, it ends in the proper place, emotionally, narratively, however. And that's, you know, like, I think this movie is like a triumph and something of a miracle that it happened. Because even though how much I love the first one, I wasn't certain that he would nail the finale. And he did. He sticks the landing. And, you know, part of that is that it might not be the finale, right? We're probably going to get more. This is only the beginning. Well, thanks for listening to our conversation on Dune, and we'll catch you next time. Goodbye, Mr. Bond. I bid you farewell. <laughs>